introduce Maria Dimling. He's a reader in Jewish Christian relations at Canterbury Christ Church University and an honorary fellow at the Parks Institute for Jewish Non Jewish Relations at the University of Southampton. Maria is a trained historian with a PhD from the University of Vienna with a particular interest in Jewish history in the early modern period, Jewish Christian relations, and aspects of contemporary Jewish identity. She is fascinated by the complex relationship between Jews and Christians and how both groups have imagined each other over the centuries. Maria has published widely on the perceptions of the Jewish body, Jewish converts, Jewish attitudes towards Christianity, and most recently food as a marker of identity and the ethics of food choices in contemporary Judaism. Her most recent book, co-edited with Larry Ray, is Boundaries, Identity, and Belonging in Modern Judaism. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here in Woolwich again, and thanks to Gabby for the invitation. I've decided to choose to speak about uh, poverty because I think it's a really important social justice issue. And as a mother, I'm uh, uh, troubled by the, the fact that in this country there are children who go hungry if they don't in the holidays because they can't get a free school meal. And the taxpayer, I'm appalled by the idea of, um, of stigmatizing people because they are benefits or by penalizing and humiliating people uh, uh, because they have a tiny third bedroom they may need for, um, you know, for their grandchildren or uh, for, uh, for, for, for a care or so. So I think the, the current uh, public debate on poverty is one where religious traditions can make a contribution to. And because my expertise is Judaism, I want to give a few examples from the Jewish tradition how um, religious traditions uh, and voices could perhaps contribute to the public discourse uh, on, on, on poverty. So I, and I have very little time, so I want to focus on a few, uh, uh, a few key issues. Sorry. Um, yeah, the first one is justice, the importance uh, of justice in Judaism. So I will be um, uh, showing a few biblical passages, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but uh, as I'm sure you're aware of, uh, Christianity and Judaism share the same um, sort of Old Testament tradition, but while Christianity went off in one direction with the New Testament that the church fathers, Judaism went off in a somewhat different direction, uh, via the extensive literature of um, rabbinic Judaism. Um, so I think from a Christian perspective, it might be interesting uh, to see what Jews have done with uh, these shared uh, biblical uh, traditions. So I really want to, to, to begin with uh, justice as a core value um, uh, in Judaism. Um, no, Deuteronomy, uh, justice, uh, justice you should pursue, and Deuteronomy gets a lot of examples uh, how uh, a society, a fair and just society, should make sure that justice uh, is at the heart uh, of this society. And justice um, is seen as a core uh, Jewish obligation. And um, 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 later rabbinic traditions, this is a international late interpretation on, uh, uh, on this passage, it says God uh, uh, prefers uh, justice, um, just behavior to sacrifices. So um, uh, a clear hierarchy of values uh, and of commitment. So justice is something which uh, builds and, and makes true tradition uh, what it is. So th this relates to the idea that it's a bit of a commitment, uh, but also as a community to make the world a better place. Uh, and one way of doing so is by, by focusing on justice. Another idea I want to introduce is the one of human dignity. Now this comes uh, a whole passage you're all familiar with, um, that Genesis 1.27 makes this very clear. Human beings were created, the element of him, in the image of God. And this is very special. Uh, it's um, 
an obligation, uh, and it also an obligation towards God, but also an obligation towards uh, the other. Uh, the idea that we are all um, created in, 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 in the image of God, and this requires uh, our behavior towards our fellow human beings to reflect uh, um, uh, this um, important value. Um, a poor person is as much a uh, great in the image of God, so much part of our family, um, an interesting um, uh, way in the, in, the, in the Bible to refer to this, uh, your brother. Uh, so we have the responsibility uh, towards a poor person like we have towards uh, a sibling. And we are not different uh, from uh, a poor person. Um, so we are all equal. Uh, and we all, as you, if you want, uh, uh, you're co-workers in this world. So it's our shared human responsibility uh, to make this world a better place. But we, because we all came from the living tradition by one man and one woman, uh, there's no hierarchy. There's no social hierarchy. Uh, there's no um, hierarchy in um, in in, in um, uh, value, um, uh, and I think that is really important. We must not think we are better than our neighbours because we share the origins. But it also means an obligation, uh, because um, as uh, Rabbi Akiva says, uh, we are being made aware that we are uh, created uh, in the image of God. Uh, so we are told, uh, and that gives us the opportunity to raise our behavior, to uh, make our behavior appropriate uh, to the obligation. Um, I want to introduce a little bit about American Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Arthur Green, who um, is at the thesis particular uh, Jewish mysticism, because I think he has written very insightfully uh, about the idea that he created in, 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 the, uh, in, in the image of God. Um, so the key point he makes, we are obliged to return the favor. And um, he goes on to say, um, it's not about new, uh, our creative powers, but we have uh, in particular how we treat others, that uh, we have to respect the other as an equally great uh, uh, person in the image uh, of God. Uh, we have to find the love in us towards uh, the other, the generosity of spirit and the full acceptance both of ourselves, it's always an obligation towards ourselves. Um, and that is also very important. Judaism does not treasure poverty. Uh, Judaism doesn't think that poverty is a good thing. So it does not encourage giving away all your possessions. Uh, and there's no point, and Jewish religion is very clear about this, there's no point if you make yourself poor uh, uh, by, by helping others. So that's a, a limitation of what you should do. Um, because you also owe it to yourself, because you're also creating the image of God. Uh, so monastic traditions are not uh, uh, of value to Judaism. But we, of course, also owe it to the other, and that's an obligation. Um, and um, Ethics of the Fathers, uh, which is a part um, of the Mishnah, so the first major rabbinical text in Judaism, which was uh, completed in around uh, 200 of the Common Era, says we must ever greet everyone with a pleasant face, a very simple sentence. So what does it actually mean? But um, we can understand this, that uh, we shine upon others in order to help others shine and to validate their sense of worth. So by greeting somebody with a friendly face, we take them seriously as a person. We don't just ignore them. And I think that that's a very important message uh, in here. Uh, the dignity you give to somebody by acknowledging their humanness, their importance. Um, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's the cleaner that um, you see when you come to the office this morning, or, or a very important person, you actually get uh, something back. And I, I think the, the idea of justice and human dignity are really two key Jewish ideas we need to keep in mind when talking about uh, how to to deal uh, with poverty. <coughs>
any rabbinic tradition, you can't just abolish the commandment because it's a God-given commandment. And even if it, you think, oh, it's not really working, you can't just abol uh, abolish it. But what Rabbi Hillel in the, in the second century did, he saw a way around uh, of providing, of preventing uh, poor people not getting credit. They need it. And so, um, so the legal fiction, as it were, was being uh, created when uh, the court um, I took an immediate position between the, the, the person uh, needing uh, the credit and, and the person who provided uh, the credit. And uh, this is perhaps something um, uh, that could be, in one way or another, uh, taken on board um, in contemporary discussions about uh, debt relief. Um, another <coughs> verse we can look at, and there are many, many um, uh, examples in the Jewish tradition uh, uh, on poverty, I'm just focused on a few, is the passage, the Levite has no proportion, no inheritance among you. And then a little further, do not neglect the Levite. So um, from a Jewish perspective, there's always a reason if something is repeated. So it's not just a editorial mistake or just an oversight or, you know, just a arbitrary occurrence uh, of a text that has, transmitted, has been transmitted over a long time, there is a reason. So um, uh, one interpretation of this is that it doesn't only refer to the Levites, so the very specific uh, group in Jewish society, uh, but it could refer to all the landless people who don't, who don't own uh, property. And a possible response to this is to um, uh, engage much more in uh, helping people to um, get a share of the land uh, they actually own or they, they can lease in a way they have security um, uh, beca uh, because it provides people with a sort of income but also stability. Um, and security, so in terms of formalizing um, informal ownership uh, of land uh, uh, and goods. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really coming to my end. Um, another, uh, I think, really important um, aspect is um, the passage from the Talmud. One who causes others to give is greater than one who simply gives. This one time to is at Ravapacha. And I think what this could imply is the importance of organization and mobilization. So uh, it's great to give on an individual basis, to give charity, but um, in the true spirit, it's even better to, to organize the community, to organize uh, as, a, as, as a bigger group, because we then uh, make a much, much bigger, bigger difference. And I don't have time to go into this, but uh, the medieval philosopher Maimonides, for example, he uh, uh, worked out a hierarchy of giving, as it were. And at the, at the top of this list is the best kind of charity, the best kind of uh, profit prevention is to help some, somebody uh, to set up a business or to an, an, another way to make them independent. Um, the worst way is to give in a way that you, uh, that you humiliate uh, the other person to be very good at it uh, graciously. So that is really important. So I'm coming to my conclusion. Um, what I would say is that the Jewish reading of biblical pronouncements on poverty, they encourage action. So I would argue that uh, what we can take from this is actually very political. So we shouldn't just accept um, this is my, my present interpretation here, admittedly. We shouldn't just accept the st uh, state-driven ideology of austerity. Um, mm -hmm. We can do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would argue that social justice is a Jewish commitment and obligation, which is um, uh, evidenced uh, widely by, uh, by, uh, by Jewish text. It's an individual commitment, so we all can do our share by volunteering, by giving. Uh, by um, um, uh, uh, you know uh, doing this on an individual basis, the charity uh, of our of our choosing, but that organised action via social justice program in a synagogue, uh, via 
you know, uh, um, bringing people together for specific cause is more effective and very much in uh, in the Jewish uh, uh, spirit. Uh, but we must never forget uh, the two key concepts here: justice. Poverty is poverty relief is about justice. Uh, um, it is not a just society if uh, people are poor and are not being helped, if people are um, uh, stigmatized because they are poor, um, and dignity. Um, so human dignity, um, somebody who is poor must never be um, embarrassed to humiliated because they are poor. Because, and there is also a key method from Jewish text, it could happen to all of us. And we don't know um, uh, what uh, awaits us, and we owe it to uh, the other because we are created in the image of God. Thank you. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the second speaker on this panel, Elisa Philip Lewis, uh, who is a young academic uh, who is a Londoner, raised in Brixton. Uh, and she's of Jamaican Irish heritage. Um, she currently manages, uh, co manages the Black Consciousness and Christian Faith Initiative alongside Dr. Steve Lesson of Spurgeon's College and King's Cross Baptist Church. Um, uh, Elisa enjoys a variety of research areas within theology, history, and religion, but specifically she focuses on theological pedagogy. Democratic. Yes, uh, for the black British community in the face of African inspired spiritualities as alternatives. Um, I'm also happy to announce that Elisa has recently married. Um, and she's married to Darren, who is the director of the building and construction company. So, thank you very much. Okay, so good <coughs> afternoon now. Um, again, my name is Elisa. Um, I'm here today to talk, you, talk to you briefly about an initiative that has just started um, and it's in relation to faith, philosophy and social justice. Um, and the initiative is called Black Consciousness and Christian Faith. Um, before I go into that, um, to build up to that, I need to give you like a little bit of background, how I got to this place and how people fit into it and also how you can fit into it as well. Um, like some of our other black intellectuals and scholars, Paul Girouard and Robert Beckford um, and Anthony Reddy. I was born in Britain. Um, more specifically, I was born to a second generation Jamaican father and a Northern Irish mother. We resided in Brixton, South London, and lived in re relative poverty. I was schooled locally in two black majority schools. My primary school was about honouring all cultures and religions. So we had Diwali, we had carnivals for everything. Easter carnival, Christmas carnival, all sorts, yeah. Um, but my second school was a church school. Um, so it was there to honour um, Christianity, but also to develop young, black, independent, ambitious women, essentially. Um, and the focus in our household was actually quite more evangelical. There wasn't really kind of an, there wasn't much culture, to be honest with you. We was about signs and wonders, gold falling from the sky, end times. That's what I know in it. I know end times. I could tell you every type of end times ever, um, but I couldn't tell you much about Bob Marley. Yeah, that was my household um, as I was growing up, um, which was obviously quite different to the girls I went to school with, um, who had quite a lot more culture, which is actually where I learned a little bit more about my blackness and my history. Uh, the role models in our house are people like Kenneth Copeland, Carmen, I don't know if you know Carmen, he's like a preacher, rapper type dude, um, but I didn't actually have any black role models in my family, apart from Michael Jackson, obviously, which always <laughs> slipped in. <laughs> I don't know how they kind of did that, but anyway. Uh, my Pentecostal roots grew when I joined a gospel choir of my friends um, and it was based in a um, Church of God of Prophecy um, denomination and we did the tours, we did gospel artists and conventions and that's when I started to understand better um, um, uh, a denomination or a Christian culture that was closely, more closely fit into actually what I was in obviously my dissension or my ancestry, my Jamaican ancestry, and the evangelical, it seemed to be quite, have a more of colorblind theology. It wasn't about being black or being white, but in um, uh, the Church of God of Prophecy, I found that there was a bigger link um, to being Jamaican or being Caribbean, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. Later down the line, um, one of my friends who I prayed with often, 
and you know we sang together and stuff she said oh Elisa I'm leaving Christianity I'm not really sure about this Jesus thing you know I read a book and you know um, apparently Jay didn't really exist at the time Jesus was around so his name can't really be Jesus and I read another book that actually says he doesn't actually exist, you know, he was created for this reason and for that reason, and I'm really confused. But I went to my pastor, and my pastor said, those are demonic ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just listen to what I tell you, don't talk to anybody else. And over the next few weeks and months, she became demonized in the church, and people were told to stop talking to that Rastafari girl over there, and all types of terms that weren't obviously actually accurate to the things she was thinking. Um, but she was treated very badly and she left and um, she's still um, not a part of the body of Christ at the moment she's not a uh, professing Christian and uh, my mind was blown I didn't know any of this obviously I hadn't grown up um, particularly um, in, in that way knowing about black culture and history obviously I knew that we come from slavery but that was the height of it and you learned that in school um, so when I started to kind of read up on what she was um, getting into it was like a whole other world. It's incredible. My mind was blown and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, but it kind of birthed a little mission because I felt, well, actually, from my understanding, there's no reason why you can't be black, conscious, and Christian. But at the moment, I'm finding a lot more of my friends are leaving church and um, asking these big questions, not getting their answers, and finding that because of the way that they're treated, um, by their, their ministers and their parents who are Christians um, and because they aren't getting their answers answered, their questions answered, sorry, um, they're finding that Christianity wasn't for them and they're finding that their identity as a black person or what was developing and evolving, they're trying to grow, wasn't really matching up um, with uh, Christianity. Uh, okay. Um, so, it was a peak point at which my mission was birthed. I realised the need for some grassroots, ground level work within the churches whereby Christians and new disciples could critically engage with scripture, tradition and themselves, forming in a positive and honest black identity in a safe and non-oppressive environment. I held negative views myself personally, previously stigmatising Muslims, Rastafari, Jews, white people, non-Pentecostals and even myself. It became evident knowledge. And that knowledge of myself was paramount and also that for Mark 12 31 love thy neighbor as thyself to be applicable um, I could only do that if I knew myself and loved that self essentially um, so to knew myself I felt I needed to engage more with my history and to understand both my ancestral culture and its historical development how we got here how am I this person who is obviously of dual heritage, what it means to me and my place, and what it means in the face of this Christianity that all of a sudden my friends are calling a white man's religion, essentially. My journey in doing my part for pursuing the justice for the black community in this sense was initialized, again, like I said, when one of my closest friends said she was leaving the church. And so black consciousness and Christian faith for me became an education the moment I realized I wanted to marry the two together. The reason we have black theology, or the emergence of African-inspired neo-pagan religions, or the processes of reimagining our identities, is simply because on the surface, black consciousness and Christianity seem to be conflicting forces. How many of us teach in our congregations that God is black? That the justice for the oppressed includes those of us who are still working through the pains and experiences of our enslaved or colonized ancestors while discovering agency and purpose? in this Eurocentric reality. How many of us are comfortable to question and reform a colorblind theology or the deceptions laying within multicultural constructs? How many of us have considered that those fringe, Rastafari, confused, conscious type people, that they may actually have a valid point? A lot of things are not adding up. So why have some of our people been leaving the church, feeling out of sorts with this concept of the Son of God? Is it that the British face of Christianity is whitewashed? or that the Pentecostal church have inherited dogma and behavior birthed by legacy of slavery and colonialism, or perhaps because they're sick and tired of feeling bad and they just want to do whatever they want to do. Maybe the powers that be, the popes, the bishops, the pastors are hiding truths that confirm the black presence as integral and threatening to their empire, 
or simply that the church is full of closed-minded hypocrites that never answer crucial questions but take on an emotional ride and pick up your loose change on the way. Loose. Is the queen a lizard? <laughs> Are black people the true Israelites? Why is there so much death at the hands of God? Can you, or we, be black, conscious and Christian? Black consciousness can be described in many ways, but at this point and for this discussion, it includes the various ways in which people strive for black unity, power, spiritual awakening, economic growth, political justice, and for some, not myself personally, indulge in a black supremacist ideology. At the mention of these ideas, some of you might start to develop a migraine, feel uncomfortable, some might feel inspired, or some have already started mentally rebuking me. My spirit of infirmity. <laughs> but it is in this space that we need to have that conversation. It's in those feelings that we need to begin on the ground level in our churches on a Sunday in the week, that critical analysis, that discussion. And so two years ago, as part of my master's research, I set up a group um, discussion called Why I Left the Church. And it was basically like an open door for everyone to come in and be like, boy, when I said this and he said this, and just basically kind of complain but share so I could get a real-time idea of why people were left leaving the church in connection with their journey to develop a strong and positive black identity. My initial feelings after why I left the church sessions, I was distressed and discouraged. Our gaps, my gap and their gap, the information and the gaps in their learning was so huge wild speculations, poor ideas of historical facts. Um, and then obviously we get the conspiracy theories, which I'm cool with. I love a good conspiracy theory, personally myself, but it's more of a hobby, uh, as Gabby knows. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus is a conspiracy theorist, but we leave that for another day. Um, and so what I found was that actually there were loads of people that were hungry to be educated, rather than sit in a conference for a weekend, rolling on the floor speaking in tongues. They wanted to have historical questions answered. Where can you point out Jesus at this time in this place? What was the colour of his skin? Do you know what I mean? Why does this book of Josephus say maybe he wasn't really a person? Answer me those questions, but what they were in fact getting was, you know, just focus on what the Holy Spirit might be telling you. And you know, learning about love and faith and how to be like Jesus, but their question was, how can I learn to be like someone I'm not sure actually existed and maybe was white or do you know what I mean and then they just gave it to our, our ancestors and enslaved them with Christianity how can I get to that point if you're not going to help me understand the beginning bit and it doesn't apply to everybody some people love to sing for two hours and experience God in that way but other people can experience God through education and through books as I continue to research, turn into non-white scholars and exploring approaches of pedagogy from other faiths, it became apparent that the crux was not that the issues were being overlooked, the work is all being done, it just hasn't really translated into us normal young people yet, it hasn't become anything that we can kind of like, oh yeah, I get that in five minutes, do you know what I mean, or in, do you know what I mean, it's, it's digestible, it's very complex, sometimes inaccessible as well, the churches don't provide the resources for the books that might be very expensive, or the, the subjects that take you no longer to explain. And the essential works remain theoretical. And in order for my research and my data uh, collection to be valuable, I realized that I felt I had to develop into an educational program um, rather than further theories of what we could be doing to make it better. And this is where we can work together to bring justice for the everyday Christian where faith meets philosophy, meets freedom, meets independence, which essentially meets refinement. <coughs> so, recently the Black um, Conscious and Christian Faith Initiative, I've teamed up with my supervisor for my master's course, um, and he's opened his doors, he's the pastor of King's Baptist Church, and basically what we do is we're trialing this program talking about a different subject that relates to black consciousness and Christian faith with Brimley Head Page Samuels the other day come in and talk to us about the possible parallels between Jesus and the horror story of ancient Egypt. We basically churn out our ideas based on the feedback that we get from the previous sessions. So if all the questions are about ancient Egypt and have we really come from there or are you know Hebrew black people the original Hebrews, we try to keep the subjects relevant. We do like an education you know, teach about what's out there and then basically let people converse because essentially they can get it all from YouTube if they want to or they can get something from YouTube, it might not be good but they can get something but what they actually want is to be heard 
a lot of these people left the church not based on the fact that they were confused but based on the way that they were treated mm -hmm. so this initiative is as much about education as about building relationships and being humble enough to say in your minds that might be slightly weird but we're going to sit and listen and talk about it anyway if you really want to know if the queen's a lizard we'll get some books and sit down together you know? <laughs> so it's just about building that relationship so the ethics is about having an open ear tackling difficult questions <coughs> accepting the mistakes on our part not every church is perfect people are not perfect and the church the institutional church is run by people and opening the floor up for all ideas so we do get people saying in Egypt and you know 5-4 this BC and all this kind of stuff and nobody rebukes them you know no heresy in here we allow everything to come up and people to develop the independence to critically assess the information that they're getting and it is you know it's tricky and it is a bit risky but so far it's working because people are coming back they say you know if church is doing this I'll come back you know we're really trying out um, a different way and it is unconventional and so I'll round up because obviously I don't know about time. But basically, further to this, we're just going to keep going. We've had two sessions so far. The feedback has been varied. Some people say, you know, you need to preach more. You know, it's all in vain if you don't talk about Jesus coming back and all this kind of stuff. And I think kind of missed the point a little bit. But other people say, you know, if you took it out of the church, maybe more people would come. So we've got quite a various, um, a variety, sorry, of feedback here. Um, but it's developing our first session. We had 100 people come. We thought we were going to have eight people. We were ready to sit in a little circle, have a little Bible, maybe a side book. We had 100 people come, people from outside of um, London come, because the demand is there. People coming from churches saying, oh, we can't talk about this in our church. And the reason why I'm saying this and bringing this to you is just as an, it's an example of how we can action justice within our congregations, where our faith um, and our philosophies in the education system, higher education system, where we can meet together and transform our people. Um, for the justice for their own identities as black people, people of ethnic minorities, um, but also justice within our churches as well to, to rectify some of the problems that we're having <coughs> communicating um, between the age groups, between the new cultures that are developing as well. Um, and so yeah, I think I, I'll round up there with this. My, uh, my ideas, I do not believe are new or revolutionary. come into the church and be what someone wants you to be, give all your money, give all your time, but Jesus is actually for you and for them individually. So I have a young, I have four children, so I have a young a gentleman in my life at the moment, is my son, who went at the crisis, and he says, Mama, I want to come to church with you when you're going next. So that shows me that this young man is in need of something, but when he talks to me, otherwise he said, I don't want your Jesus, and I don't want, you know, this you do what you're doing over there and I'm okay here. But in, in actual fact, when he, he's sinking, there's a Jesus that he knows that can say. And this is what the church, I feel, this day is neglecting to show people the Jesus in your own location. The Jesus that is the real Jesus, not this thing that you said people make up in uh, uh, this orchestrated church service and they use Jesus to perpetrate their own actions and take the little bit of resources that you have, with energy that is taking you to come to check to look for what is in there for you. They take that off of you and make you into somebody else and you leave there empty mm -hmm. and you really need Jesus in your life, you know. So I say education and coming into this place is very important to let people know that there is something more inside of you that we can give you back. We're not here to take from you, we're here to give you. So that is what Jesus means for people, and I thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Okay, uh, second question was, yes. do you want to respond to that? Sorry, sorry, okay. Was it behind Yeah, I want to ask a question from uh, Dr. Miriam. Maria. 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 Yeah, you said that God created mankind in his own image, Genesis 1.27. Now, when uh, Dr. Page, last week he taught us in Islam, pillars of Islam, he said that God created man on his with clots of blood. Cloth of blood. I don't really understand cloth of blood and his image. That is first question. Mm -hmm. 
That is my first question. The cloth of blood and from God image. The second one, he said, the second one, he said that regarding to social justice in Christianity and Islam, he said that in the pillars of Islam, the Saka, they say the 2.5% of their asset, capital asset, they gave it as an arm to the poor as justification of a weight. Of a, but in the Muslim Christianity, 10%. But now he said that in the Muslim, 2.5 is, is more valuable among using in a in a valuable way than the Christianity. I don't I want you to throw light to that one for me here. Can, can I pass this on to Omiya since you luckily we have an Islamic scholar here? Uh, okay, so if I understand correctly, you're asking whether the two point five percent zakat comes to about the same as the ten percent tithes in the Christian tradition. Um, it's and 2.5% zakat is on the entire, well, it's worked in different ways depending on different things. So it can be on gold, it can be on sheep, it can be on money, it can be on the entire world. So all in all, it does come to, I'm not sure if it's equivalent, but it, it, it comes to quite a bit. But they say, what I'm trying to, what I want to clarify is, they say that that money, if the, 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 wealthy, the wealthy man in the, I mean, wealthy people in the Islam, they use that money to sponsor many people to uh, hide a pig or something like that. But, they, I mean, they, they use it in a godly way. Let me put it in that way. In that way. But in the Christianity, maybe when they say tight, Maybe the priest, they are not tight now today, meant for the pastor. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's meant because in, this, because in the Old Testament, they said it's for Levi. But now, I think it's for pastor alone. That is what I want to. Because, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor's the left hand. Yeah, I don't think he can tell you that. Yeah, you don't talk to anyone. I think it was the third question. Sorry, sorry, I think let's stop the hubbub a minute. Sorry, please. Just to um, clarify, what's your name again, sir? Michael. Michael asked the question, and what we're basically saying, we don't think it's for the Islamic scholar to answer it because it's about when as Christians in Christian churches you're giving your tithe that's your 10% of your net gross it's part of your income probably with a net income or something what is that used for so but that's for pastor to answer I think you take that to your church <laughs> yeah but he can't answer this all right then all right let's let's move so, on with I, and now I'm going to ask my question. Yeah, sorry, please. Do, do, do you want someone to contribute in a question that is posting for? Yeah. Well, if somebody can, then I'll sit down. Sorry, please. I think maybe the church you come from, they let you know that the title is for the pastor. It doesn't mean that way. Generally speaking, if anybody is a New Testament, Testament member, mm -hmm. it is not a title. It's supposed to be an offering. And when we put in offering, it's you have to be on yourself, between yourself, how much you give in and how much you earn it. So you put up the money into the way you want to do it. Some churches make it to be like a tithing to you. But that is used to run the ministry, not for a pastor. So it maybe if you see your pastor is embezzling the money, that, is that way you have to ask your pastor, what is that money used for? Okay, so that is not mean for pastors. The money is not for pastors, it's for running about the church. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead. Which I will be. Sorry, um, just to say thank you, um, Dr. Mary and Elisa. Yeah, Elisa. Um, I think your, your talk sort of complemented each other in the sense of how it hit me. And, and um, I'm, I just sort of feel blessed to be in the presence of a young person as well that's taken on some of the issues that I've personally battled with. Um, going through the church, and I was one of those backsliders, and an Indian I converted to Catholicism. Don't ask me why I just did. So I can drink my wine when I want to. If anyone is going to judge me, I say, let God judge me. Yeah. But <laughs> but um, Dr. Maria, so the question or what came to me, uh, and I think it's something that always hits me with religion. We're always talking about how we treat each each other. And just to give you an example, when I came here today, the first thing downstairs I say morning to everyone and didn't necessarily get an answer. And I always try to say that that is exactly it. It's the way we treat each other. 
if there's a Jesus, that Jesus is in me, and if I don't reflect it, it isn't in me, or it certainly is asleep that day, or whatever. So when you say that we are all equal, immediately what came to me is, no, we are not, question mark. So I don't know if you wanted to come back on that at all. And then for Elise, I'm taking my time, because last time I did that, I didn't get back to get back to Dr. Beckford. <laughs> um, um, love yourself, you said this thing about um, loving yourself, uh, love, my, love your neighbour as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I wanted to get back. I think there's a great African proverb that says, when you point a finger at somebody, as I'm sort of oh, doing that, the other, there's three, right, that points back to yourself. So, but you are right. I have to know myself to be able to have a voice, to be wanting to support somebody else or encouraging somebody else or even to be a pastor talking to somebody else. And I think that's where when the young people are having their issues and their concerns and their questions, if they're not being addressed, effectively they're turning their back on the individual, not necessarily believing in a higher power, whatever it is. That's how I concluded it for myself. And I do see myself as being one of the original Hebrews, but that's another story. Okay. Um, I think it's a, equality is, is an idea, and we're, we're trying our best. We're just human beings. But I think Judaism um, is very much aware that's how it should be. Uh, despite, of course, you know, the differences in society, in class, and in common words, uh, in Jewish culture as much as, as elsewhere. But, um, for example, if you think about funerals, um, funerals are as simple as possible. Um, that it's not a show-off. There are no expensive coffins. There are no huge flower arrangements. Horses are strong uh, because everybody, uh, nobody should be shamed in death. Mm -hmm. because they're poor, because their families are poor. So when the richest person is buried, either just wrapped in, in, in the shroud or in a very, very plain uh, wood, uh, wooden coffin. And I think that's a very powerful symbol of aiming uh, uh, to equal, be equal in life, or perhaps not always, but we should be, be equal in death. So I would say it's, a, it's an ideal uh, uh, Jews aim to strive at. But of course, people are not perfect. Excuse me. Do you have the next question? Um, there's the next round of three. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Gentleman there in the black jacket. You there. And gentleman at the back. So, yes, you're up next. Yep. Should I stand up? Whatever you want to stand up, ask your question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. My question to, um, first to the doctor is that do you think that there's a political party which best represents the solutions to poverty in Ireland and the Jewish religion? And my question to you would be how you found that um, consciousness in regards to your faith in Christianity? Has it touched that in there? Have you found conflict? And you have, have you gone past it? I, 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 I don't really think there is um, a British party that tackles this. Uh, uh, when I, I really uh, chose on justice and dignity because I think the public discourse, and I'm saying this as a person who's not allowed to vote in this country because I'm not British, uh, but I think that, that it's neither about justice nor about dignity in the public discourse. The only party I can actually think of is an Israeli party, which is Hadash, which is a strongly communist influenced Jewish Arab party, uh, where uh, social justice is very much part of their, of their manifesto, but they are not particularly successful. But I, I don't see it in the British landscape, actually, sadly. Uh, I don't think it's in the left part. I think we have some sort of grown used to this um, language of austerity that uh, benefits, see, somebody on benefits has become a byword for somebody who is lazy and uh, basically uh, a parasite. So it has lost the neutrality of, uh, of the words. And I think the, 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 the current debate is not about solidarity. That people don't feel proud that their taxes support society but they, they feel disadvantaged because they pay taxes which support other people. 
and I, I think the public discourse in the UK needs, needs to change to reflect justice and human dignity. Okay, um, and so my journey with black consciousness and Christian faith, I find that it has strengthened it. Um, I do feel that at this time it's given me more of a sense of purpose, to be honest with you, it's given me some direction. Um, like I said before, I grew up kind of evangelical stars and wonders, oil coming from your hands, I'm from that kind of stream. Um, and I think for me, coming from that stream, it, I wasn't afraid of what was difficult, or a difficult history, or a difficult, you know, some a difficult... Uh, I don't know. I guess I, I kind of felt bold. So every time I read something that might say, you know, Jesus doesn't exist, or this is alternative history, or maybe Jesus is a ripoff from ancient Egypt, I, I feel that um, I feel more in, in, inspired to find the truth, basically. And I think that's what Black Consciousness is doing because it's helping me obviously place myself in England as someone of dual heritage. Obviously, I might not have the same issues as some of my friends who may be darker skinned women um but dual heritage obviously can carry its own prejudices as, as well especially as a woman um but i i find that it's given me it's helping me to see the rest of the world as it is rather than in a closed box just seeing brixton just seeing my church every sunday and the ministries within church and just seeing my pastor it's challenged me to look outside of that because god's looking down and seeing everything do you know what I mean? And to answer your question or your statement, I guess, is that under God we are all equal. Under man we can't be. It's impossible because we're imperfect. But this has given me, I guess, a sense of purpose into try and realise, as um, Dr. Miriam was saying, that justice and that equality through our faith. So looking at some of these difficult questions, bringing the equality in the way that we just discuss and meet with each other and with anybody, um, interfaith discussions, bringing that social justice and reflecting that equality from God into the rest of the world is basically at the minute what it kind of looks like for me. Um, and so, I mean, people are, are experiencing it in different ways. People are finding it very difficult. They can't leave the house, you know, or they're changing, they're getting all their tattoos and changing their whole appearance aesthetically because they're finding the conflicting forces very, very difficult. But I found <coughs> in the book I read, I found more of God. I found more of Jesus. In every narrative from another part of the world, every ancient culture, I'm like, I recognize that story. And I feel like it's given me a bit more boldness to be a lot more open than maybe what some of my past churches would have allowed for and accepted, essentially. So for me, it's, it's bringing more freedom, which is very positive, um, and I'm hoping that other people find that as well, rather than kind of the fear and the guilt factor, I guess, is the response. Yeah, my question goes to my fellow brothers. Yeah. That gentleman, they just, he asked two questions, but one was answered. He said um, the first question was that God, uh, we are created in the image of God, which I do understand from my own from my own religious view. And he said, in the Muslim, from the clot of blood, man was created. Can you explain to me what, what it is? Um, yes, um, so are you asking, is there equivalent to that teaching? Yes, yeah, man is out of sun, we are made by sun. But the you know, Muslim, clot of blood, is it woman blood? Where is the blood coming from? <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't think we have exactly the same um, metaphor in, um, or imagery in the Islamic tradition. Um, but there is a verse of the Quran that mentions the um, phases of life and how a man is, or a woman, as the case might be, is created in the womb from a clot of blood. That's, that's very physical, it's not very metaphorical. Okay. So, um, okay. Yes, uh, sorry I came late. Last week I was the first person here, so this week I just <laughs> <laughs> I thought the balloon was, uh, was uh, 9 to last week, so I was here about uh, 9. Well, I'm happy that I'm here because I enjoyed this kind of symposium, and thank you for what you've shared so far. But, my question or statement goes this way. Now we discover that uh, the Jewish people, they are the most, they suffered more mm. in terms of racism than any, any other race in the world. Now, the question I'm trying to ask is that, why is it that we black all over the world? Why don't we see how do we solve the problem of the black man in terms of 
what do we do? Because take for instance, if you have a if you have a church in Woolwich, and this church is about ten or eleven, and every week you, you contribute one pound, eleven pound multiplied by how many, you'll be able to help a young one black boy on the street. Then all the time you see a black man is complaining. Oh, this person did this to me. This person and nobody can solve your problem. Until you learn to say, I'm going to tackle my own problem, nobody will solve your problem. So I want, how do we do to solve the problem of the black man? I'll answer that in three words. I'm sorry for everyone else, we'll have more chance to discuss. We've got other panels coming up, but I am conscious of the time, so we need to keep things yeah. moving. Good. Yeah. Thank you for both presentations. I have a question for both of you. The first one, um, Elisa, um, how do you turn the Bible study and that, um, um, that event into either a movement, which then impacts other churches, <laughs> other communities, or even allow it to impact on the liturgy, worship, hymnody of the church. So I just wonder if there's any spillover, if people have then said, well, actually, we need to change this song, or has it impacted the preaching, the church? And also, is there a desire to turn it into a, a movement of sort? Because that's often been the weakness, that the discussions take place, yeah. people get inspired, but then there's no movement afterwards. First question. And then Maria's, I think there's a point of connection between both of your studies, because you, you mentioned the Hebrew Bible quite a bit, and, and many of the issues that emerge from the identification that African people have with the Hebrew Bible. And I just wonder, Maria, if you think that there is any grounds for some of the claims made by some of the new black religious groups that the Hebrew Bible is in effect a, a text that has been um, uh, disguised and has obfusc obfuscated the reality that it's about black people. Do you see that there's any credibility in that argument at all in terms of uh, that's that idea? And also, a more easier question is, um, <laughs> uh, to really, is what do you see within the Hebrew Bible that might provide support for this kind of attempt to syncretize both Christianity, or two religious traditions, really? Is there any hope within the Hebrew Bible that might inspire that kind of activity? So a, a mixture of questions to both of you. Okay, so I'll start first. Um, yes, there we, I mean, I'm not sure if movement is the right word in the sense that I'm not planning to be the face of anything like, in, in the sense but my hope is that I'm, I, I plan to kind of put together some sort of kind of educational resource pack as a start for any church to take and say cool we've got about 5, 40, 100 people that have these type of questions related to this specific thing here's some information to help us discuss, help us relate some churches have been like, oh my gosh, can you come? And I'm like, well, actually, you could do this yourself. All you have to do is have an opening ear and be willing to read a bit and share. So in, in a sense, the movement is that we hope that it from fanning the flame of people catching on. Because a lot of it is just about having the open ear and the humility to have these discussions. Um, and then also providing the education so that it becomes obviously informative as well. Because some people want it. Um, want to have an, a, an academic experience in church essentially is what they want alongside their worship or their all-night prayers or whatever. So yes, um, in a sense, it, it looks like a movement. I guess what I'm looking at the moment is something quite similar to an, an, what an Alpha course looks like, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. specific to the black British community and um, the cultures that are coming out of it and the religious ideas that are coming mm -hmm. out of it, tackling those questions. So in a sense, that's I'm hoping what the future is going to look like. Of course, it looks like that any church can get involved in or host, essentially, because it is an open discussion as well as a form of education. Um, what was the second part? I think, I think, was it about becoming a movement? And, um, and has it impacted the liturgy of the church? Because if, if, if people are coming into the church and asking critical questions mm -hmm. and saying, that isn't true, this isn't true, yeah. has that, do, does the church then after that have the next service? It should, it should, it should be in, impacting what, what the church looks like, 
in terms of the institutional church or your church session, it should impact that. I was very fortunate one day to go to, I'm not Catholic, but go to a Catholic church um, for a christening for my husband's cousin. And all the images they used, um, biblical images or stories and stuff, were all black people or Africans. And I was a bit like, I've never seen this before. And it was like a white majority church. And I was a bit like, this, why can't we see this in a black majority church? Mm. I don't understand why we don't see it. Do you know? I mean, it didn't make any, And I was a bit like, okay. And actually, what we're doing and what we're hoping is that people will develop the independence to say, Pastor, do you know? What I mean, like, why don't we try this? Actually, based on what we've been talking about, you say, you know, there's an there's an essence of um, God connecting to us through oppression and sacrifice and all these kind of things. So why can't we see that in our liturgy, in our images, in the books that we have? Why do you keep selling us this blue-eyed, blonde-haired God all the time? Why can't it look a bit different? Some people, it doesn't matter too much. Um, but I do think that there is room for it, and I'm hoping that it doesn't necessarily come from me burning down churches and, you know, you know putting <laughs> pastors on, on YouTube and stuff like that, all that kind of stuff. I just, yeah, I hope that this initiative inspires the people at the grassroots level to actually say, let's stop as a congregation, let's change some stuff, um, obviously according to the word of God, but that brings justice for us as a black community, definitely. I'm hoping that it will inspire that and that it will come from the people as opposed to one particular person, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think in, in response to your first question, we actually have an expert on this, Gifford, I'm looking at you, uh, who could comment on this much, much more, with much more expertise than, than, than I can. Um, and in response to your second question, uh, yeah, I know, the Hill Bible is such a rich collection of, of texts uh, and, you, you know, uh, we can we can uh, certainly take it uh, take it that way and also in response to, to this comment earlier uh, the such a problem of the black man so to speak um, I think there is a lot of scope also cooperation uh, between uh, Jews and black Christians we've seen this in history uh, you know Abba, uh, Abba Heschel, uh, was very close to Martin Luther King and and there's a lot of solidarity solidarity mutual support uh, South Africa, uh, Jews were very much at the forefront and involved in the AN ANC. And uh, the Hebrew Bible can, can provide, I suppose, the proof text for this kind mm. of political action mm. that brings the group together and, and changes the world. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last question, Mike. Hi, yes. Uh, I have a question for uh, Maria Dimlin. I hope I pronounced your last yeah, name. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and uh, I missed the first part of your talk, uh, but I very much uh, uh, liked your, uh, your, your uh, pro-social justice conception of Judaism. And uh, um, so I have two questions. One, I'm wondering if uh, this sort of uh, conception and uh, uh, encouragement of, of, of activism and uh, social justice, global justice, if they are groups or movements, either in the past or today, that you can point to that uh, embody this uh, sort of conception. So I had one uh, uh, question. And then the uh, second one, uh, perhaps you did mention, say a few words about this, but I missed it. And I know you, you, you briefly mentioned human dignity and social justice. I'm wondering, what is what, what would be uh, your interpretation of the basis for uh, or the understanding of human dignity, what is it based in, in Judaism? Is it a uh, you know, relationship to God of yeah. one way or, or another, or some kind of human nature? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in response to your, your second question, uh, I, I, I explained this at the beginning of the talk. It's really based on Genesis 127, human beings are created in the image of God, and therefore we all have the, 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 the right to, to, to human dignity and must treat each other on the basis of the notion that we are reflections of God uh, in a nutshell. And in response to your first question, there are, lo there are a lot of very different uh, movements. Social justice has become uh, quite an increasingly important concept in Judaism since the 1960s. And some people see this critically because they think it shifts uh, the, w the way towards a more secular observance of, of, of Judaism, that uh, traditional values have become more secular and embrace 
uh, a, a really broad church from rights for Palestinians to uh, uh, rights for LGBT people, uh, abortion rights, uh, uh, environmental rights, etc. Et so some, some people see this critically and say, oh, it's basically the embracing of liberal political values, and this is not, not what Judaism is about. Having said that, it, um, it is now really part of all Jewish denominations, so even the, the very observant traditional ones, so the, cur the current chief rabbi uh, of Britain referred to it specifically in his inaugural speech when he was ordained as a rabbi, and um, it, it offers, um, uh, I suppose, a way of acting in the Jewish way without observing dietary laws or necessarily going, going uh, to synagogue regularly, but making the world a better place, and that is the that is the, 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 the main the underlying issue. It's our obligation to make the world a better place in uh, with our means, and the, the, there are numerous uh, Jewish uh, organisations that engage with this. We really from environmental groups to uh, children uh, asking that their uh, bar mitzvah present should go to a social justice cause to people. Uh, planting uh, olive trees uprooted by the Israeli army uh, uh, in mm. Palestinian fields. Mm. Mm. Uh, so all on the umbrella of social justice. So it's a very broad um, range of often highly political activities, but which people do uh, because they think it's a, it's a way of living a meaningful life in a Jewish way. Not necessarily strictly following religion, but in a in a socially active way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for our speakers. Thank you. So